The 3DS. Wow, I made a video last week and you guys ate it up. I was supposed to be finishing off my East 1 and 2 retrospective, but since the 3DS is pretty much dead in a few days, I thought I'd squeeze out this bad boy beforehand. Thanks to my Patreon supporters for supporting me, and don't worry, East will be on there in the coming days. Alright, you guys know I love RPGs, especially of the J variety, and the 3DS did a commendable job in providing us weebs with milk to suckle on, and I've compiled a list of all the essential, or at least the ones you should probably check out at least, the JRPGs on the system. It turns out there are quite a lot, and considering the eShop is hitting the dust soon, physical may be the only way to go, and thankfully most of these in this list have physical releases in some way, despite some of them being ridiculously expensive. Let's just delve in and see what I think. Alliance Alive. You've got to start with the A, right? Especially when it's alliteration. This was a co-development between three companies, Cattle Call, Grezzo and Furyu. Three companies with a really nice track record and legacy. It was also published by Atlas in the West. Things are looking good. How about the fact it was written by Yoshitaka Murayama, who created the first three Suicoden games? I need a change of pants. Now, I am getting a bit too overly hyped because it turns out to be just a pretty decent JRPG rather than something completely mind-blowing. This released very late in the 3DS's life, in fact, the Switch was already out so it did get overlooked, but as a bit of a silver lining, it did get a HD remaster on the Switch later too. But you can't go wrong with the 3DS version, although if you want a physical copy, it appears to have only been released in North America. Devil Survivor Overclocked is undoubtedly one of my favourite games on the 3DS, as you'll have found out if you watched my Top 25 video. Technically, it's originally a DS game, but uh, this 3DS version added a lot more content, more monsters, and even full voice acting, which is quite amazing considering how much dialogue there is in this story. And there is a great story from what I remember, with likeable heroes. The music is just incredible, and the gameplay is of the strategy RPG kind. It's part of the Shin Megami Tensei franchise, so expect lots of familiar demons to fight against and aid you in battle. Definitely essential. Devil Survivor 2 Record Breaker is the sequel. Also originally a DS game, very, very late one at that. I mean, in Europe, this came out on the DS in 2013, two years into the 3DS's life. And after this remake was announced, I still find that really bizarre. I haven't personally played this one yet, but I did purchase it just before the eShop closed. They had a very nice discount, which I lapped up. Once again, you are a high school student fighting off demons that are threatening to destroy the world. And once again, this remake contains a whole new chapter and adds a big chunk to the length of the game. Stellar Glow was the final game from Image Epoch, uh, the kind of company who settled into life as makers of B-tier JRPGs before going bankrupt. But Stellar Glow may be the best of them. This is a strategy RPG, very bright and colourful with good production values, and with Sega, Atlas, and NIS America involved in publishing, it's probably one you should look into picking up. It has a musical theme to the gameplay, and the soundtrack is a highlight. There's even a relationship building with the witches that join your team that can affect the ending. It's a good old chunker of a game too. I'm liking the inspiration of Final Fantasy Tactics, where being on higher ground and attacking from the sides can affect your attacks. Also a big fan of the speed-based turn order as well. I really wish more tactical games would use that. Soul Hackers is a game I've tried to get into multiple, multiple times, but for some reason I just bounce off it or I get distracted by something else, which is a shame because I love the concept. I just need to push through and commit to this one. This is also part of the Shin Megami Tensei universe, and it's a cyberpunk dungeon crawling RPG as you explore modern environments in first person. I love the style, the character design. Originally it was a Sega Saturn game, second part of the Devil Summoner thread of the Mega Ten universe. This is actually very affordable, despite the very niche genre. And yes, JRPGs are kind of niche, but, but this variety of it is very, very niche. I definitely hope I can get through this properly one day. And by the way, if you want to support a bit more Jordan, i.e. me, and you don't fancy Patreon and its awesome perks, like really, you know, Patreon's really good, but you do want some 3DS games in your life, then check the links in the description. 3DS games that are still available to purchase brand new, linked in the description, get them while they last, buy it and support me. But just remember the 3DS is region locked, unless you're a bit uh, naughty with your 3DS. Now, there are two Persona Q games on the 3DS. Sadly, they're not the Persona games many people were hoping for, but as spin-off titles, they are very, very good. 
Taking the characters from the recent Persona games, they've been shoved into first person dungeon crawling, kind of like Ectrian Odyssey. In fact, it was made by the same team, more or less. The first one is Shadow of the Labyrinth and arrived in 2013, while Q2, New Cinema Labyrinth, came out in 2018, much to people asking why it wasn't on the Switch. This one adds Persona 5 characters to the cast, and both games are well received, and you know, dungeon crawling fans will want these stylish releases in their lives. 7th Dragon 3 Code VFD is a game I really need to get into at some point. Even though it's the fourth game in the 7th Dragon franchise, and the only one that's been officially released in the West, the series was actually produced by the legendary Ryoko Kodama, who sadly passed away last year. She was also the producer on Skies of Arcadia, which if you watch my long retrospective, is a game I hold very dear to my heart. So I definitely need to play this at some point. It didn't get much publicity when it released. Sadly, the European physical is stomach churningly expensive, but uh, maybe one day. And in America, it's not exactly cheap either. Conception 2 Children of the Seven Stars is a lot more affordable, probably because it's one of the lower tier JRPGs on this list. It's also one of the few that released on both 3DS and Vita on the same day. There was very little crossover between the two handheld consoles, but this was one of them. Why is it called Conception? Well, let's just say that the main character is a bit of a stud, and some mildly perverted writer decided he wanted to push the limits of weirdness by breeding star children with S-rank female classmates. So I've never played this one because the premise alone kind of puts me off, but it's one of those that some people really, really enjoyed, while mainstream media slapped a 6 out of 10 on it just to be safe. Now, there are 6 Etrian Odyssey games on the Nintendo 3DS, and I'll group them together into different categories. Firstly, the mainline games, there were three of those. Number four was Legends of Titan, five was Beyond the Myth, and although it wasn't numbered, Nexus was the sixth mainline game. These are almost classic old school style dungeon crawling RPGs. You look from a first person perspective through handful of dungeons and battle monsters with your crew. All characters are user created from a handful of classes and the story definitely takes a back seat. This is kind of back to basics but presented very well. The main gimmick is that you use the touchscreen to draw your own map as you advance, making it more easy for you to go through next time. While the 3DS may be slightly oversaturated with Etrian Odyssey games, you need at least like one or two of them in your collection. Nexus came out ridiculously late in the 3DS's life, so there wasn't exactly a huge print of those. Between Etrian Odyssey 4 and 5, Atlas didn't want to waste sweet milking potential, and even though Etrian Odyssey 1 and 2 are easily accessible DS games to be played on the 3DS, Atlas decided to remake them. Etrian Odyssey Untold, The Millennium Girl, and Untold 2, The Fafnir Knight. While I've not had the pleasure of playing these remakes yet, I am led to believe there's a bigger story focus this time around, and of course, the 3D effect plus some other tweaks. It's worth noting that the Nintendo Switch will be getting Etrian Odyssey 1, 2, and 3 very soon, although they aren't based on these versions, so this is still something unique to the 3DS. And finally, the final Etrian Odyssey game on the 3DS is actually more of a spin-off and a crossover, Etrian Mystery Dungeon. This was going super cheap last year, but it shot up in price, and, and it was only available physically in Europe, I believe. But yeah, you can probably guess what this game is all about. It's now a top-down perspective, and is more in line with the Mystery Dungeon gameplay, just with Etrian Odyssey tropes like class types and giant superpower monsters once in a while. Definitely want to pick up if you're into dungeon crawlers like myself. This also got a sequel on the 3DS, but uh, it never left Japan. What sad times. Xenoblade Chronicles 3D is one of the best games ever made. Unfortunately, of the three versions to play this game, the 3DS version is the worst one to play. That's not to say it's bad by any means, it's more of a miracle they managed to fit it on the system, perhaps why it's exclusive to the new 3DS variants. And when that was revealed, man, my eyes lit up to the potential of the new power it would have, but then they just didn't really use it. It was only for this game, I expect. But whatever, this is one of the greatest JRPGs ever made. Story, gameplay, presentation, all 10 out of 10. Music, ha! Huh. And if you don't own the Wii version or the Nintendo Switch Remaster, there's no shame in playing this 3DS release. Honestly, it's not that bad. And if you're playing portably, like actually going somewhere, it's more bearable than the Switch, which, let's face it, only ever goes to your sofa, your bed, or your toilet. Admit it, 
Fantasy Life is perhaps more of a life sim than your standard RPG. It has similarities to many an MMORPG in fact. Here you choose one of 12 classes available, whereby you take on different tasks that are common to that job, whether crafting or fighting. It has oodles of charm, and one may call it a cozy game. Its soundtrack was also made by the legendary Nobuo Uematsu. That's worth the purchase alone. While it did have a few sequels from level 5, they stayed in Japan, but there is another sequel coming that's going to be released in the West on the Switch later this year, so look forward to that. Now this is a handheld system from Nintendo, so that must mean there is a busload of Pokemon on it, and you don't even need to poke em on it. <laughs> In order to not drown in Pokemon games so quickly, I'll separate the mainline stuff from the spin-offs. I'll talk about those later. But first, talking about the proper mainline Pokemon games, the kind of Pokemon games everyone likes, well, there are eight of them, so you're absolutely spoiled for choice. And while I fully admit to once being a hardcore Pokemon fan, to the kind of being mildly apathetic towards the series, the only ones I played on the 3DS were the first ones, Pokemon X and Y, which were, well, they were fine. They were fine. Fine, fun games. Too easy to handhold in. Oh god, please, for the love of all that's holy, shut up and let me catch Pokemon. Okay, you know, it's fine. But I've been told by more hardcore fans that Game Freak got better and better as the system went on with supposedly great remakes of Ruby and Sapphire, then starting a new generation with Sun and Moon before expanding on that generation with Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. You've got more Pokemon than you can possibly handle and that's probably a good thing. They're perhaps the most accessible games on this list in terms of playability, mechanics and even availability. They printed like a billion copies of them. You're good, no panic buying. Get at least one of these, preferably one that doesn't have the Bidoofs. Fire Emblem Awakening is another one they printed a lot of, much to Nintendo's surprise. This was supposed to be Fire Emblem's last hurrah after being stuck in a rut in terms of evolution and Nintendo's bank balance, but Awakening pulled it out of the bag. This is one of my favourite games on the 3DS. It just hit all the right notes when it came to balancing a great Fire Emblem game. Interesting story, good characters, relationship building without it like completely taking over, no gimmicks, just a really good, memorable time. And Fire Emblem wouldn't be where it is today without it. I would say this is absolutely essential. Following on from the success of Awakening, Intelligent Systems, the developer, went all out with the next entry. In fact, it should be said entries because they made three games pretty much, all following the same bunch of characters and mechanics, but from three different perspectives, making them almost a like, completely different experience. Fire Emblem Fates, released with Birthright and Conquest, and was quickly followed up by Revelation as DLC, but also released on a cartridge that was very special and is incredibly pricey right now. That's three whole games. Now, personally, I played a couple of hours of Conquest, but something just didn't hit me as good as Awakening. Maybe it was the characters, maybe it was a different translation team, maybe it was the fan service focus, but it didn't gel with me as much as before. But a lot of people still love this trifecta, so I should probably give them another go, right? Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia is the final Fire Emblem game released on the system, and it's the one that is often forgotten about. No doubt because the Nintendo Switch literally just released a month or two before this hit the 3DS system. It's actually a remake of the second Fire Emblem game, and includes dungeon crawling aspects. I haven't played this one, but I have it, and I'm definitely willing to give it a whirl. It'll probably appeal to the older fans of the series, those who are less inclined to the modern entries. But it was also translated by the same team as Awakening, so that's another good sign. At least for me. If you're looking for an alternative to Fire Emblem, how about the series' old rival, Langrissa? That's a name one hasn't heard since the Clone Wars. This was the first entry in 16 years, and I know a lot of people are fond of the Langrissa games. I personally enjoyed what I played of the 1 and 2 remake on the Switch, so the 3DS game Reincarnation Tensei may be a decent option. Reviews were kind of all over the place for this one, so your mileage may vary. Probably better to stick with Fire Emblem. Kingdom Hearts 3D Dream Drop Distance isn't exactly your typical RPG, even action RPG may be pushing it, but I might as well include it. This was one of the big early announcements for the system, and had so many people hyped about it. Personally, I haven't delved into the series too much aside from sampling many a demo, but I'm not a Disney fan, so it didn't manage to melt my frozen heart. Did someone say frozen? 
Nowadays, this is probably best played on one of the HD collections on the, like the PS4, but there's a charm to them being on the 3DS, I think. 3D visuals, man! Now, Shin Megami Tensei. We've had some spin-offs, now it's time to get down with the real deal. Even if for many, this has been outshone even by its spin-offs these days, but whatever. Shin Megami Tensei 4 is a badass game, but one certainly not for the faint of heart. I don't know if it's difficult, but perhaps it's not the most accessible, at least from what I've played, having heard others' opinions on it. I like it, a lot. I can't say I'm a fan of their hair design, but I'm hardly a beacon of fashion myself. This came a whole decade after the last numbered entry in the series, and was critically acclaimed. Very dark, of course, but well worth getting through those first few hours to see what it really has to offer. Then came Shin Megami Tensei 4, Apocalypse, which at the time of announcement confused myself and probably a lot of other people too, since I assumed this was just like an updated version of the original game, you know, like Persona 4 Golden, kind of same thing, just with extra stuff, tweaks. But no, while it shares the majority of the gameplay mechanics seen in 4, the story is completely different. They should have dropped that 4 numbering hard, and they'd have got way more people interested initially. And apparently this didn't sell that well, no doubt thanks to the terrible marketing decision, as well as the 3DS being taken around the back of the barn for a bullet to the head. The Switch was only a few months away when this released, at least in the West, but still, don't sleep on it, you definitely need it. Well, if you thought Apocalypse came late, how about this? Shin Megami Tensei Strange Journey Redux, coming out on the 3DS a year after the Switch was out, during a time when Atlas seemed to be blissfully ignoring that system. But hey, let's throw this remake of a DS game on the 3DS. Where have we heard that before? Oh yeah, it's Atlas. They're amazing, but a bit weird. This is in a first-person perspective with 300 demons to recruit. It's just standard stuff with the series, but what sets this apart is the location in Antarctica. It's also very separate from the other Mega Ten games, really its own thing. I don't think the print for this was huge, so again, try not to miss out if you, you know, if it's still available somewhere. Crimson Shroud, however, you've probably missed out on because it's a digital-only release, at least in the West. This was published by Level 5, where they had a bunch of famous developers create small, focused games of distinct genres. Crimson Shroud was from the mind of Yasumi Matsuno, better known as the director of Final Fantasy Tactics, Tactics Ogre, Vagrant Story, big, big names. This is actually more based on tabletop gaming, which, you know, respect to all those players, I ain't nerdy enough for it, okay? But it looks pretty ace, even if it's not something I have much interest in. My wrist gets enough of a workout, I don't need to be straining it with dice. Yokai Watch, once touted as the Pokemon killer, and literally was a phenomenon in Japan for about 5 minutes before everyone realised level 5 were milking it far too much, far too quickly. In just a few years, there was a bewildering amount of Yokai Watch games, and even though it landed like a wet fart at the funeral in the West, we still got 8 releases. Obviously, with this being like Pokemon, not all of them are completely unique, but let's just go with it. Okay, we got Yokai Watch 1, good start. Then there's Yokai Watch 2, which came with two initial releases, Bony Spirits and Fleshy Souls. But then came Psychic Spectre a few months afterwards. Then there's Yokai Watch 3. And then somewhere in there, there was spin off Yokai Watch Blasters, which came in Red Cat Core and White Dog Squad. But then there was a free update to that called Moon Rabbit Crew which I believe is only available digitally. It's not really another game, but it is a healthy chunk of content that is added to those two games. And no wonder Level 5 gave up releasing Yokai Watch in the West. It died in Japan and was, you know, it was, I don't even think it was ever alive here. They are good games. Many people say they're better than Pokemon, but good grief allow people to digest them a little bit before releasing three more. Come on. Radiant Historia Perfect Chronology is a game I would probably absolutely adore. But I'll get to why I haven't played it much in a second. Uh, so this is a game published by Atlas. It's a fascinating game about going through different timelines to help prevent disaster. Something that's been done before, perhaps giving similar vibes to Chrono Trigger. It's universally claimed for both its story, gameplay and classic visuals, and is perhaps regarded as the number one JRPG on the system. But let me tell you my little anecdote as to why I've not played it for more than like an hour. Because firstly, this is originally a DS game. Nothing wrong with that, we've talked about plenty of DS games being rejigged for the 3DS by Atlas. 
Why? Because, well, money. When it was ported to the 3DS, there was new artwork, new story scenarios, which is all good in that. But if you're going to port a DS game to the 3DS, at least have the decency to add 3D effects. It doesn't use it, which considering I love the 3D effect, I just found that a shame because I will get to this one day. It's just I have to get over that mine annoyance. But yeah, you should definitely have this in your collection. Mario and Luigi were also rather busy on the 3DS. These are RPG light games, much to the chagrin of Mario RPG fans, but they are fun games nonetheless. They may not be the games you were hoping for, but you can still have a good time with them, as long as we forget Sticker Star. Ain't no one having fun with that. First up, let's talk about Dream Team Bros, and then there's a crossover with Paper Mario, Paper Jam Bros, but then there are two remakes. One which was welcome, and another one that was a bit of a head scratcher. Superstar Saga, the GBA game, was the welcome one. It even included a new mini game, Bowser's Minions. Bowser's Inside Story was the weird one, considering, well, it's a DS game, perfectly playable on the 3DS, and also dirt cheap, readily available, and nothing was added aside from another gameplay segment, Bowser Jr.'s Journey. In fact, this was so unwelcome that it has the honor of being one of the worst selling Mario games ever. With this failure, like it literally sold like a couple of thousand copies. Yeah, with this failure, the 3DS was dead to Nintendo and anything still in development at that time was canceled, like immediately. It was too late, too pointless. I suppose it's still like a good game, whatever. It's a pity then that the developers of the Mario and Luigi series went bankrupt and I entirely blame Nintendo, who obviously didn't pay them enough to make these games, nor did they give them projects worth doing that could have been a success. I mean, who thought Bowser's Inside Story would do well? Nobody. The Dragon Quest series didn't love the 3DS as much as it did the original DS, which is a shame, but hang on, at least two of the very best games in the series made it. Very super late into the system's life, we got Dragon Quest 7 and 8. Now, the biggest question I got when I did my favorite 3DS games was, where the hell was Dragon Quest 8? Well, it's because I haven't found much time to play it yet. Again, where is the 3D effect, guys? I was quite disappointed, but I will get to it sometime, I promise. Both games are absolute beasts in terms of quality and content from what I've heard. If you don't have these on their original systems, then definitely get the 3DS versions. The Pokemon Mystery Dungeon games are the most high-profile Pokemon spin-offs that are actually JRPGs. You guys know I'm a fan of the Mystery Dungeon concept, and these are great introductions for newcomers. The first one that hit the system wasn't particularly well regarded. Gates to Infinity was thought to be you know, tedious, although I would argue that's part, you know, that comes with the territory, but it was also watered down. The next game, Super Mystery Dungeon, was much better received for having more content, more Pokemon, deeper systems, and more respectful to the player. So yeah, Super is the one you'd want to go for, but you know, having played Gates to Infinity, I thought it was fine, I suppose. Monster Hunter Stories is what happens when Capcom want to get in on the Pokemon type gameplay. Turned out pretty badass. Befriend monsters by stealing their eggs. Don't worry about the morality guys. Their mama would have just eaten them anyways if they turned out to be a bit of a runt. This is a great game with turn based battles, good story, everything the normal Monster Hunter lacks. It got a sequel on the Switch not too long ago and this is probably an essential game on the system if you ask me. Legend of Legacy was Cattle Call's game before Alliance Alive which was the first game in this video if you remember that far back. This isn't quite as well regarded, I mean the name alone doesn't give me much hope. That's despite it being written by Masato Kato, the same writer as Chrono Trigger and composed by Masashi Hamauza, who worked for Square Enix on quite a few projects. Still, while it may not be the most essential release on this list, it's one of those that would not look out of place in your collection alongside Stellar Glow, Alliance Alive and so on. If there's ever a game on the 3DS that had fans sad that no one seemed to take much notice of it, it's Ever Oasis. You fans just won't shut up about it. It came out like a month after the Nintendo Switch, so of course no one cared, but it was made by Grezzo, one of their rare non-remake projects. You build up an oasis by doing missions and stuff, so it's got town building. Let me just go order this game right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm sold. 
I'm loving the aesthetic, I'm loving the gameplay type, and the developers thought of this as a spiritual successor to the Mana series, so yeah, get this before you regret it. Moko Moko Friends is a game I'd literally never heard of before making this list. In fact, just trailing through like a complete list of 3DS games, it's lucky I had the urge to Google what the hell this was, because it turns out it is in fact an RPG. Sounding like it should be part of the Moshi Monster series or something, or like a shovelware puzzle game, but okay, maybe it is. It's obviously a budgeted kids game, but it's got like monster battling like Pokemon, and it looks kind of alright. I mean, I wouldn't stick my nose up at giving it a try. There are two Bravely games on the 3DS, Bravely Default and its sequel slash not quite sequel, but kind of is until marketing got involved, Bravely Second. Yeah, the first game in the series, I really like, even though it has its major issues at the end, but still, I think I made my point in the previous 3DS video I did, yeah, go watch that. Bravely Second, End Layer, I haven't had the pleasure of playing yet, but if it involves spending more time with the same characters as the original, I'm all for it. And hopefully, that one doesn't soil the bed at the end. Gurumin 3D is, well, okay, this is only on this list in the loosest possible of senses, but you know, I really enjoy the game and I want to talk about it in some capacity, so here it is, especially since I've been playing it in the last few days. It's made by Falcom, so it must be good. It's actually something a bit different compared to what you may be used to between East and Legend of Heroes. It's a bit of a kid's adventure and it's a fun game, albeit a bit simple. Sadly, this is digital only, but if you missed it on the 3DS, it's also on the PSP and PC. Now, personally, I wouldn't exactly call Monster Hunter RPGs, but uh, it's hard to know exactly like how to qualify them, but some people would say they're RPGs, so I'll allow it. While Japan got a healthy selection of Monster Hunter releases on the 3DS, the West only got three. But not to worry, because they're basically the best versions of what was released in Japan anyways. Monster Hunter 3 and 4 Ultimate, and also Generations. I have dabbled in the series a little bit. In fact, Monster Hunter 3 was my first one, and I played it on the 3DS, making use of that Circle Pad Pro. <laughs> Remember that? Ah, uh, weird times. Now, if there's something to be said about Level 5, it's that when they have a half-decent IP, they decide to flood the market with sequels as soon as humanly possible. And having multiple variations of each release, just for that extra floodage, may I present to you the Inazuma 11 series, footy RPGs that have a great premise, if made a little bit too much for the kids, at least the ones that I've played. There were loads on the DS, and there are loads on the 3DS. In fact, as a North American exclusive, you got Inazuma 11, like the first one, as a 3DS game even though it was a normal DS game in Europe, and I remember having it. Yeah, that's weird. Inazuma 11.3 arrived in three variations. Once again, this was originally a DS game, but only in Japan. While Europe, the footy nuts that we are, we got them as 3DS games, with Lightning Bolt and Bomb Blast releasing at the same time, and then Team Ogre Attacks releasing a bit later. Then Europe also got Inazuma 11 Go, which had two variations, Light and Shadow. Then how can we forget the sequel to those, Inazuma 11 Go, Chrono Stones, which also had two variations, Wildfire and Thunder Flash. Again, these only released in the West in Europe, which is understandable, but a bit of a shame. I mean, like, once it's been translated to English, would it have been, like, too much trouble, too much hard work just to print a few copies for North Americans? I'm sure there's, like, three soccer fans over there. I mean, football fans, okay? Never mind. Anyways, that's, like, eight physical releases for this series. It's a good series. I've really enjoyed the few that I've actually played. I just wish it wasn't like so geared towards like younger kids. Room Factory 4 is a brilliant game. I think we can all agree with that. It mixes the farming life sim of story of seasons with dungeon crawling, hack and slash RPGing. It's great. I put dozens of hours into the third game in the series, which was original on the like the original DS. And the little I've managed to play of 4 is just as good, if not even better. The gameplay loop is very, very strong with this one. And if I was to go like play any farming life sim style game, it would be this one for sure. Return to Popular Croix, a story of Seasons Fairy Tale, is another farming sim mixed in with an RPG, but this time it's a turn-based RPG. And while I would freely admit it's not the best like on this list, there's something about it that makes me very fond of it. Perhaps it's because, you know, when I started doing YouTube videos like six, seven years ago, whatever, on my old channel, this was the first big publisher game that I ever got, and I was amazed they even like gave it to me. Thankfully, it was good too. A pretty easy game, but a lot of charm from what I remember. It's been a long time, guys. Lord of Magna Made in Heaven is actually from the same publisher. I can't say I'm a huge fan of the art style here. It's chibi and then some. 
Like, they couldn't get more chibi even if they, they were just like floating heads. But give it a try. It's a strategy RPG, but more like Valkyria Chronicle style, where you can move your characters in like full analog style, but restricted to certain distances. You're not on a grid or anything. Perhaps this isn't much to write home about, but it's one of the more obscure RPGs out there on the system. The Theatre Rhythm Games. Yeah, alright, the RPG aspects are pretty minimal here, but god can I just have an excuse to talk about them. Absolutely love them, my favourite games on the system, and watching your little chibi characters battle it out against equally cute monsters and, you know, you do the business getting in the rhythm, I love it! Now, okay, perhaps I was a bit too dismissive about the RPG aspect because even though you can choose to ignore it, there is a bit of tactics involved with setups and things like that. Ah, who am I kidding? Just buy it, okay? Especially the Switch one. Get it on the Switch. That's just like, it's almost the perfect game. Metopia is a JRPG with Nintendo written all over it. It's a life sim kind of game wrapped in like a JRPG skin, and it's adorable and endlessly hilarious. It's like Tomodachi Life mixed in with a choose your own adventure JRPG. Now the 3DS version is perhaps not the best way to play it these days since it rightly got a remaster on the Switch, but still this is highly recommended as a more left field choice as long as you don't take it too seriously. Ain't no anime boobs in sight for this one. One Piece Romance Dawn is an RPG based off the famous manga series. Obviously as a licensed tie-in, it's not exactly a world beater and may actually be the worst game on this list if we're looking at it empirically, but uh, you know what, as long as you go in expecting the expected and you're a fan of, you know, One Piece, it's not a bad one. I wouldn't recommend it to just anybody, but it's an easy one to forget about. I don't think many will remember this being as a JRPG, but it is. Final Fantasy Explorers. Wow, this is a JRPG list, and of the 80 odd I'm mentioning here, this is the only one that bears the brand Final Fantasy. What the hell is that all about? Come on, Square, you let the side down hard with the 3DS. Well, I guess they made up for it on the Switch. Speaking of which, where's the HD remaster of Final Fantasy Explorers? This is an action RPG that's best played with friends, as you have a classic job class, you go on quests, something similar to like Monster Hunter, and it's full of content but perhaps lacking in story. Reviews were mixed on this one when it released, but it's still something I would like to pick up and play if given the chance. Fossil Fighters Frontier is when Nintendo wanted to make another type of Pokemon game and then failed to market it. This is the third entry in the very obscure Fossil Fighter series. It's got dinosaurs, it's got battling, how could this possibly go wrong? Sounds like the best idea ever. Well, it only got average scores because it's obviously aimed at a younger audience, those who think dinosaurs are the best thing ever and still have them on their lunchboxes, basically me. But I enjoy them for what they are, definitely not like a top ranking game by any means, but considering it's published by Nintendo and is a Nintendo property, this is mildly obscure. The Project X Zone games are wonderful and weird. Strategy RPG crossovers that blend Capcom, Sega and Bandai characters into one. While the story is a bit all over the place, because of course it is, and it's also a shame because I do love story in RPGs, that's mainly why I play them, but the novelty of seeing tons of famous faces work together and have fun attacks in a Fire Emblem-like world is great. I've only played the first one, but I can't imagine they went wrong with the second one either. In fact, I would hope they smoothed out some of the rougher edges that appeared in the first. Tales of the Abyss was one of the early 3DS games, one of the early must-have JRPGs when the system was lacking it. But what a game to have, it's kind of random to have this particular Tales game instead of like Symphonia or something, but Europe wasn't worried because this is the first time we actually got this game officially. This is a huge, long game, massive story, and a pretty good one, even if it takes time to get going and also get used to the main character whose growth is more akin to a tumor early on, but he does get more likable as it goes, right? I would say that this is a game you should have in your collection, and it's a massive pity there were no more Tales games on the system. I mean, Japan did get like one or two more, I think, because of course they did, but we in the West just had to look on or learn Japanese. And let's end this list with not a full RPG, but the one you create yourself. RPG Maker Fez, or is it Fez? I don't know. It's an RPG creation tool that allows you to make your imagination run wild as long as you stay within the limits of the stock assets. 
Yeah, these non-PC versions are hardly the best way to create your masterpiece, but still, it's fun to dabble in it like, nonetheless. And you can also sample other people's works via the free player app on the eShop, but obviously, that might not be an option nowadays because that's dying along with the eShop. If you're watching this within like, you know, like the, as soon as it's published, then quickly download that free app player, then download all the, the games, okay? You don't have a lot of time left. So, there we have it. What have we learned from this video? Mostly, if level 5 have something mildly successful, they then milk it to within an inch of its withered life. No wonder they almost went bankrupt. We've also learned that Atlas only seemed to wake up when the console is already dead. Yeah, I think that's happening with the Switch as well. I think we only just got the Persona games on there. Whatever. We've also learned that the 3DS was an absolute beast in terms of JRPGs, and this isn't even concerning like smaller indie titles on the eShop or Virtual Console. Please subscribe, check out my long retrospectives, that's the main content on this channel. I might do some videos like this in the future as well, but that's what I love doing, the retrospectives. If you like JRPGs, you will love my other content, like me talking about Sui Coden 2 for 3 hours. I have a Patreon as well, that would be nice if you joined. And special thanks to my super producers, they, Sven Naulert, Rich Sartorius, and Wixit, plus all my other supporters out there. Very soon, we will have East Retrospective on the Patreon, and it will be publicly available not too long after that. Peace out.